we've looked at the first three sacrifices, the, uh, the whole burnt offering, the olav, which uh, was, is the most important sacrifice. It's fundamental to everything else. It was offered daily on behalf of the nation and was a prerequisite uh, sacrifice. No flying animals. It was a prerequisite sacrifice for all other offerings. Um, we noted the procedure both for worshiper and priest, the meaning the death of the animal stood for the death of the sinner and uh, what the animals must be. The minha was a grain offering. Um, it was part of the daily ritual as well, uh, probably indicated both the gift or tribute to, uh, to the king, in this case God, recognizing his greatness and his uh, worthiness to be worshipped by the people. Um, it was uh, either raw or baked, always with salt. Uh, the priests would uh, undertake to offer it and would keep most for themselves. So this was not only uh, a gift on the part of the worshiper to God, but it was one of the ways in which the priests uh, received uh, food and, and so forth. And so this uh, uh, fits into the overall uh, idea of uh, uh, fellowship. The sacrifice, the shalomim, was the pea, or peace offering, uh, was made again with atonement and tribute offerings, and these kind of form a triumvirate, which we'll distinguish in a moment. Had the idea of wholeness, uh, resulting from a covenant with God. Again, it was a, uh, a blood sacrifice, the worshiper laying hands on the animals, the priest placing blood, burning part of it. The rest was eaten by priests and worshipers. Two types, the thanksgiving and then the one that would accompany the making of a vow. And so we find, uh, uh, we find this as the third. Now these uh, sacrifices uh, really break into two uh, sets. The atonement, gift, fellowship offerings um, and the sin reparation offering which we'll cover in a moment. The first were voluntary they focused on procedure. Um, these were not obligatory for every person all the time. Uh, it was undertaken by the priests for the nation. But uh, in terms of an individual, uh, these, were, uh, these were occasional as they would be moved to do it, as they would be moved to bring a gift, as they would be moved to come and give thanks to God. Uh, this was the procedure. And there are certain times through the year where uh, the nation would offer these gifts. Again, as God would command them to give thanks to Him, they would, uh, they would have these atonement as well as the gift offering. The next two that we're going to look at are the sin and the reparation offerings. These were mandated. When certain things happened in the uh, individual's life or in the nation's life, uh, these were uh, prescribed. These had to take place if the person or the nation uh, was to maintain fellowship with God. And it focused on occasions. And so just note that you have kind of a three and two here, the first three being those sacrifices which uh, would give a general picture of the way uh, a person could approach God in fellowship. But these offerings being then what were mandated because of certain, uh, uh, certain situations. And so just note that there, there is uh, some uh, distinction between the first three and the next two, not that they are disrelated or would never occur together. Now, that brings us to the sacrifice, the hatat or the sin offering, the sacrifice which is the sin offering. And uh, the basic uh, purpose of this was to restore a rift in fellowship due to sin, some specific sin. And I'm going to uh, do a little thing on clean and unclean here in a moment uh, uh, that will underscore the fact that, that the whole of Leviticus has to do with God's presence among His people and how it is that He can be present among His people. And so we see a res restoration of, of gift in fellowship uh, due to sin. This was the, uh, uh, the nature of this. Occasions could be for ritual uncleanness, 
And as you read through Leviticus, you were kind of uh, puzzled by some of these things, maybe overwhelmed by it, all of the different ways a person could become unclean. And as you read it, a lot of it you thought, well, how could you avoid that? Why is that your fault? Well, it isn't. Um, touching a dead body. Well, if dad dies and I have to bury him, what else can I do? I have to do that. I'm commanded to do that. That's part of honoring my parents. And so uh, there are just things in life, by living life, that made one ceremonially unclean. Now, remember, this is not hygienically unclean. You know, we're finding little bottles of uh, antiseptic all over the school now. There are those who think if we squirt those on our hands all the time, nobody will get sick. I don't subscribe to that, but that's fine. All right? It's not talking about that. It's not even talking about moral uncleanness. It's talking about ceremonial uncleanness. God, remember, is giving big object lessons, and I'll return to this clean, unclean. So certain times of the month for a woman, certain uh, experiences that anybody would, uh, uh, would undergo, um, or inadvertent sin. Now, the Leviticus does not talk about um, sacrifices for high-handed sin, that if somebody decides, you know, I'm going to go out and steal something tonight, blah, 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 that's premeditated. There's no sacrifice for that. Uh, when David uh, sinned with uh, Bathsheba and in murdering Uriah, and Nathan comes and confronts him, you know what David says? He says, ah, I'll go off for a sacrifice. No, he didn't. His confession is, uh, in the Psalms, against you, you only have I sinned, and I say this, that you might be justified in whatever you do. There was no sacrifice for David's sin. So the sin offering in Leviticus is for inadvertent sins. You know, you just lose your temper. Somebody does something, you fly off the handle, and you yell and say something mean and nasty, and, uh, whoops, I've just blown it. Anybody ever had those kinds of experiences? Yeah, we all do, okay? Not with anger or something else. And so that's just life. We do things that are an affront to character of God. We don't intend to. And in fact, sometimes we don't even know about it until he points it out to us in some way. And so on those occasions, this offering would be brought because sin causes a tear in our relationship, our fellowship, I should say, with God. And so these are the two general kinds of occasions. The procedure would vary depending on the importance of the offerer. If it's the high priest, a whole lot more is required. Community, other leaders, the individual, and so it goes through this. Now, that probably indicates that while all sin has an effect on our fellowship with God, some sin has greater uh, damaging effects with respect to the community, with respect to others. And the more important or the prominent place or the place of responsibility the offender may have, the more severe the, uh, the, the effect in terms of the nation. And so that is uh, indicated here. Uh, also, more expensive to less expensive animals went along with this uh, uh, varied procedure. That bird's flying along there. Isn't that cool? Uh, again... Like with the other sacrifices, they would lay hands on the animal, they would uh, uh, slaughter the animal, and then the sprinkling of the blood would have been the same as the other sacrifices. The fat of the animal would be placed on the altar. The remainder would be burned outside the camp, and none of this was used by the priests. Now, that's a significant difference than the other offerings, isn't it? This is an offering for sin. Nobody benefits from sin. It all is in payment to God. And so the, the sin offering is, uh, is that which uh, is uh, mandated by God for either ceremonial uncleanness or for uh, inadvertent sin, specific violations of the covenant standards, which were objective and able to be uh, uh, appraised. And the offer then was responsible for bringing this in order to, to uh, mend the rift in fellowship between the offer and God. Now, of course, you know, how often could that, would that happen in a day? How often might it happen in a day with you? Oh, there might be 50 times in a day where this might be necessary. I mean, we just don't, aren't given the details as to how often this would have happened, but 
Um, it, you know, it was objective enough. It, ha- it had to be done for things that were laid out in the law. And it doesn't cover every minute of life. But God is giving it as an object lesson. My presence with you is in spite of your sinfulness. My presence with you demands uh, something with regard to my character of holiness. And our relationship can only be established and maintained through sacrifice. And so taken together, all of these sacrifices are making that point. And so this becomes a most important sacrifice with regard to the daily fellowship of the individual with God. The other of these two that are mandated is called the asham or the guilt reparation offering. And what this was was a payment, a payment over and above the loss incurred by transgression. So if I get angry and I strike somebody or I hurt them or I kick their cat and it dies, you know, oh, I got to pay for that, okay? And so there was a restitution built into the law. And so while my sin affects my relationship or my fellowship with God, it may also cost somebody else something. And therefore, this was a uh, a sacrifice that went along with that. It was a payment over and above the loss incurred. The procedure was a bloody sacrifice of a ram for atonement. And notice how this isn't the asham, but it becomes the prerequisite for it. And that goes back to the fact that this is the the basic uh, uh, sacrifice for, for all things. The fat was burned, the meat went to the priest. So this is different than the sin offering. There is a uh, a participation. And then there was payment to the victim for the harm done by sin. So this was a very equitable system. Uh, This meant that society would work, that, uh, uh, that the life could go on in the community. And so we see this uh, as the the third uh, or the the fifth of the offerings. So the first two are just general with respect to uh, uh, their voluntary uh, nation, uh, every day for the nation. Uh, The second uh, or the 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 uh, the fourth and the fifth are are mandated. And so we really have the uh, covering the full perspective of life in terms of a people living with their God, living in the presence uh, of, uh, of their God. Um, I'll come back to this. I want to just I go to uh, a discussion of the clean and unclean. And uh, you don't have this in your notes. Uh, this is just some new material I'm going to add. But um, the fundamental truth of Leviticus is that God is present. God is present. That is the fundamental truth of Leviticus. And he is present in special ways and places. He is special in everyday concerns. Special ways, special places, and then just everyday concerns. And all of the laws of Leviticus uh, get at that. Uh, He's in the glory cloud above the ark. Uh, he's in the, the sacrificial system. He is present in, in how the nation gathers around him and in everyday concerns. And in, uh, throughout these uh, in Leviticus, you get these long discussions. And in chapter 18, you have this long discussion about sexual uh, conduct. And it just is meant with everything else to indicate that God is part of, uh, of every part of life. And so Leviticus uh, brings that uh, home in every way that it can. The phrase that uh, brings this out, I am Yahweh your God. And over and over and over again, we see that repeated. I am Yahweh your God. In uh, 27, he says, Therefore consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And so that brings us to holiness. God is present. He is God. And the motto of Leviticus is, Be holy, for I am holy. Because of who God is, we are to be dedicated, set apart to Him. We are to be suited for service to Him. And the idea of holy basically is to set something apart. And then it is to uh, 
uh, suit, that which is set apart for service. And in 10.10, he says uh, to uh, Aaron that he needs to go into the uh, tabernacle in a certain way. He must not drink wine when he is in his service. Uh, And he says, so that you may distinguish between the holy and the unholy, between uh, the unclean and the clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. You've got holy and common. The opposite of holy is common. It's not unholy. It's common. Because holy means set apart for special use. Common means, eh, it, you know, anything, anything can be used. It can be used for anything. The uh, verb which makes something from special or set apart to common is profane. To profane means to take something as common, all right? Um, Loaf of bread. Loaf of bread is about the most common thing uh, that there was in the, the nation of the people. But the bread that was put in the, uh, the holy place was, uh, was holy. It was set apart bread. It could only have one use. Uh, a vessel, a tool, an implement, a tong to pick up meat. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a tool. You could use that tool for all kinds of things. But once it's put into the service of God, it becomes holy. That is set apart, separated for that one use. You probably have things like that in your own uh, possession. Something that's common is sanctified, that it is, that it is set apart and therefore becomes holy, which simply means it is designated for a special use. The whole nation of Israel is like this as a people, and individual, uh, in, individuals in the nation, like the priesthood, are set apart, the, Levi- the Levites are set apart as a tribe, all of the things that were in the tabernacle are set apart for special use. You also have clean and unclean. Now, something is unclean, it's polluted, and it becomes unclean. In order to get it from unclean to clean, what does it need? Cleanse, that's right. And so you have this process going on in Leviticus. Things are holy, they can be profaned. If they are profaned, they need to be rededicated to God. Things are clean, they can become unclean. Human beings can become ceremonial and unclean. All right? So all those different things that could happen. Inadvertent things, things that have anything to do with. And cleansing then puts us back into a position where we can then be sanctified, uh, the person be sanctified. Now, here's, uh, here's a little chart. I'll, I'll put this all on, an over, uh, on, a, on a sheet and, and hand it out to you. Things are holy. They can become profane, polluted, and unclean temporarily. Now, there are some things that were permanently unclean that could never, ever be used in God's service, some animals that could never, ever be eaten, okay? And uh, yet, uh, there were some things that could become temporarily unclean, people being the primary. When that happened, they needed to be cleansed. When they were cleansed and became clean, then they could once again be rededicated to God's use. And so this is the cycle that you have going on through Leviticus all the time. That God is holy. God is absolutely sinless and pure and perfect. And yet, He chooses to live among a people who aren't. And calls them to service. Calls them to special dedication. And uh, when they are um, thus dedicated, (laughs) He uses them. And He lives among them and He relates with them. And so both from a national standpoint and from an individual standpoint, this is the dynamic that Leviticus is bringing out, is that God is holy, and I am to be holy. I am to be set apart to Him. But there are things in life that make me unsuitable and unuseful for His service, both ceremonially and practically. And what takes care of that? Sacrifice, all right? And it's a continual thing, isn't it? And this is exactly the picture that Christ is giving to His disciples in uh, John 13, the upper room discourse. He goes around to wash their feet. Peter says, you're going to wash my feet? No, you aren't. He says, well, if I don't, you have no part, fellowship with me. 
And he says, I'll wash my whole body. And he says, your whole body doesn't need washed. You've been bathed from the eternal penalty of sin. But you need to be continually cleansed from the daily defilement of sin in order to be in partnership with me, in fellowship with me, in what I have called you to do. That's Leviticus. He's preaching to them Leviticus. Important book, isn't it? And this really is the book of how to live in the presence of God. And so while it all looks very strange and convoluted and unnecessary to us, yet it is not uh, not unnecessary uh, at all. Now let me go back to this uh, thing on how Christ is the uh, fulfillment of the sacrifices. Um, when we get to the New Testament, we find that Christ really uh, fulfills all of the different aspects of, of the sacrifices that has to do with relationship. Uh, he is, uh, it's His blood and sacrifice emphasized in Romans. I'm going to come through each one of these again. Jesus, the spotless lamb, just write down the phrases there on page, uh, what is it, 53. Uh, his sacrifice is looked at as a sweet perfume. Uh, Jesus is a sacrifice, is a God's expression of love. And he's the high priest. Now, these are, are some of the more significant uh, summary verses in, in the New Testament. Now, they're coming here. There it is. Jesus' blood and sacrifice. That's number one for Romans 3.25. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier. Um, The sacrifices in the Old Testament were like a credit card uh, payment for sin, just charging it. Who's going to have to pay for it? Christ. And so it's His blood. Secondly, he's the spotless lamb, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. We're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. His sacrifice is a sweet perfume, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and has given himself an offering for our sin. And uh, Jesus' sacrifice is an expression of God's love, 1 John 2. Um, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He himself is the propitiation not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation, the satisfactory payment is what that means, for our sins. And so Christ is the fulfillment and the key to all of uh, uh, what is happening in Leviticus or what is indicated in Leviticus. Uh, there's, there's two passages here on, uh, on the uh, high priesthood of Christ. Just look at the second one, Jesus the high priest. Uh, such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. And so Christ is the fulfillment of, of all that the, the sacrifices in the Old Testament uh, point to. And it's only through His sacrifice that we can enter a relationship with God initially and that we can live in fellowship with God. And so in 1 John 1, it says, you know, when we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. And it's His blood that keeps us in a cleansed position as we walk in the light. And that's Leviticus. The first uh, nine chapter, verses of 1 John is, is Le, you know, Leviticus really tightly compressed. And, and so that's, uh, that's what we have. And so it all had to do with sacrifice, this, this so important aspect of, of taking an animal and using it uh, or, or, or offering it in the place of the sinner.